got two great presentations that will be followed by a moderated round table. So starting with my first question, if it loads, okay, what type of organization do you represent? And you can go to that, uh, that poll everywhere link and it'll pop up here in the, um, in the presentation so we can see those responses live. So it looks like we have mostly city and mostly others on the line, mostly cities. Awesome. All right. My next question for you all is, have you attended a feral hog forum hosted by NCT COG before? Um, our last forum was about two years ago in August of 2019, and I know we hosted a few prior to that as well. We'd love to know if you have attended or not. All right, looks like mostly no for attending a feral hog forum. Just very exciting to have some new faces. Hopefully we'll get some uh, new information shared today. Um, and since you have not attended a feral hog forum hosted by us before, hopefully um, this information that I am about to present to you about COG's uh, TMDL program will be new as well. Awesome. Okay, so what is the North Central Texas Council of Government? So we're a voluntary association of local governments with other over 250 members. We assist our members in planning for common needs and cooperating for mutual benefit. Um, the TMDL program, uh, the focus is on bacterial impairments, specifically for E. coli. Uh, many things can cause these impairments, such as pest, pet waste, illicit discharge, wildlife waste, such as feral hog waste, and more. Um, and it's important to address these impairments in order for our waterways to meet their designated use, such as recreation. So a TMDL or a budget is set to ensure that waterways can safely maintain their designated use. Uh, in North Central Texas, there are currently 23 impaired waterways in the TMDL Implementation Plan, or IPLAN, which is shown on this map here on the screen. The most recent addition was North Fork Fish Creek in the Mountain Lake Tributaries watershed. So through this IPLAN, COG works with local governments and members to implement BMPs to reduce bacteria sources, such as participation in regional initiatives, such as the Wastewater and Treatment Education Roundtable, Integrated Stormwater Management or ISWIM, and other uh, outreach and education methods and more. The IPLAN also guides projects and workshops selected by members like today's workshop. So currently COG is working on developing some educational materials for city officials and executives, as well as apartment complexes. We also have uh, lots of other available resources, including um, a super simple, what is a total maximum daily load educational explainer video, resources for on-site sewage facilities or septic systems, um, discouraging avian feeding, encouraging uh, pet owners to always pick up after their pet and lots more. We also distribute quarterly newsletters and an annual program summary, which highlight activities that are going on in our region. All right, and before I turn it over to Rachel, does anyone have any questions? All right, looks like not. So we will turn it over to you, Rachel. Just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Great. Um, you can go ahead and go, I guess, to the next slide. Um, Thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, my name is Rachel Richter. I'm an urban wildlife biologist here in the Dallas Fort Worth area with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And I'm going to basically kind of cover the basics of feral hogs and some information about their biology and the damage that they cause. Um, next slide, Hannah. Okay, so um, starting off, what are feral pigs and how did they get here? Well, the term feral basically refers to any wild or any domesticated animal that has reverted to a wild state. And so feral hogs are essentially the descendants of domestic pigs. They were first brought to the continental United States by the explorer Hernando de Soto in 1539. Um, as part of his expedition, he brought 13 pigs along with him um, because they had to eat, eat as they were crossing the United States on foot, right? 
and um, they weren't exactly carrying refrigerators around with them. And so pigs were a good source of food because they survived well in our environment and they also reproduced quickly. Um, so some of those pigs managed to um, uh, find their way out on their own as a part of that. But that wasn't the only introduction of pigs. Um, in the early 1900s, we also had the introduction of Eurasian wild boars, which are the which, wild boars are the species that pigs were domesticated from. Um, so they were introduced for hunting purposes um, over the course of several years. Um, and we also had free ranging farming methods that kind of facilitated the escape of pigs that happened that were this practice was common until the 1950s so the pigs that we have today are a mix of these domesticated animals that have become feral as well as the wild boars um and hybrids of the two so um you might hear people talk about that or speculating about what type of pig they saw, whether it was a wild boar or it doesn't matter at the end of the day. They're all the same species, so there might be some um, visual differences, but they're all the same and it, it really doesn't um, make a huge difference. Um, next slide, please. So to give you an idea of um, the spread of feral hogs. This is where feral hogs were in 1982. If you could go to the next slide. And this is where they were in 2018. So there's quite a bit of spread there um, into new states and also much farther north. There was for a long, long time a thought that feral pigs um, wouldn't do very good in the colder temperatures and that's no longer the case. Um, and you can see now in Texas, um, hogs are found in every single county except for El Paso County. Next slide. Reasons for the, the pig spread. So part of that is because pigs are highly adaptable generous, generalists. They are op opportunistic omnivores and the majority of their diet comes from plant material but <clears throat> the majority of their diet comes from plant material but um they do eat um insects and sometimes you know other mammals and birds as well um they'll eat pretty much anything that is made available to them they also have very low mortality rates um the only natural predators they have. So bobcats and coyotes will occasionally pick off. I think we might have lost Rachel entirely. Yeah, let's give her a minute. We can talk on her slide if you want me to talk on her her slides that she has right now just to kill some time. Sure, that would that sounds great. OK, so while we're waiting on Rachel to hurry and get back to us, um let's add a little bit of info into this reasons for spread as she was saying highly adaptable generalist omnivores we can eat all kinds of plant material as our standard main diet but they are uh, potentially eating some kind of meat toads snakes lizards all of those other things um, they do have a very low mortality rate <clears throat> naturally just very good survivors uh, reproduction is very quick when we're we're talking about hybrid reproduction. Um, so not only do we have um, multiple litters a year, but we have large litters uh, multiple times a year. And so that has helped them produce. And it also helped them reproduce because that's the way we farmed pigs. So as a culture, we farmed pigs out on the landscape. Free range hogs was a big thing for a lot of years in the, the Americas and the colonies. And so that's always something to remember is, is some of this is because of man's way 
of having reproduction and, and supporting those animals as a food source. Um, that leads us into that human transportation. Before we started a hunting sport out of feral pigs, it was we transported pigs for our own consumption and farmed them out on the landscape. So once we got into the hunting side of it, now we have folks wanting to have a hunting opportunity, catching pigs and transporting them to new locations to increase their opportunity for a sport animal. Uh, and that has, we have seen in the last few years, um, a lot of legislation that has limited transport and movement of feral pigs across the United States in an effort to help reduce the spread. It has seen obviously some uh, mixed re results and mixed feelings from the hunting community because it's, it's taking away some of their opportunity. Uh, at least that's the way they believe it. It may or may not be uh, true, but it does, it, it was used as a tool to, to limit the mobility of feral pigs. So, okay, next slide, Hannah. So, like we were talking about reproduction, females breed six to 10 months uh, of age. Their success would <laughs> correlate to their size. Um, they potentially do have year round breeding, but like any other herd animal, uh, we do tend to see seasonality when everybody starts cycling together and we start seeing seeing litters uh, being born concurrently together uh, that just works out better for for reproduction uh, anywhere from that four to six piglets we know that that the mix of domesticated animals in with the, the wild type of, of pigs tends to lead to bigger bigger litters we may even be back up into that 10 10 pig litter uh, with their you know the amount of domesticated uh, bloodlines in there um, and of course, when we have great uh, resources, we've been wet in Texas for the last three, four years. We've had great rainfall, so that has led to higher reproduction, uh, higher success rate, and just a, an overall explosion of, of the population. So these estimates, uh, the population growth, um, you know, without the control effort, potentially we triple our population every five years. Um, that's that's their slide. 66% um, <laughs> of the population must, must be removed to stop the growth. Uh, and that's, that's true. That's been something that we put out for many years about how much uh, population control is truly needed to, to be able to keep a population in check. Uh, at current estimates, we are nowhere near that 60% of uh, population control in the state. When we use this number, current control efforts uh, is about 29%. A lot of that is is from our, our agency, USDA, doing the control efforts. Uh, and so we touch about 1% to 2% of the landscape in getting to that 29%. Uh, most of this doesn't take into account the private sector, uh, whether they're private trappers, uh, helicopter, private helicopter efforts, uh, and all those things that aren't uh, regulated or kept a tally of. And so some of that is an unknown, un a truly unknown uh, subject there as far as how many we truly are. I suspect we have a lot more effort in the private sector going on than, than we can actually realize or have the ability to, to control or to calculate. Oh, I'm sorry, there you go. Uh, so again, population double every five years. Again, that's um, without effort. I, I'm not quite sure where I'm sold on that, but science says it should do that. So next one, Hannah. I'm back now. Can you oh, all hear me? Rachel, there you are. We are moved on a couple <laughs> slides. I know. I should have just kept quiet. Let you do the whole thing. No, we're out of here. <laughs> Sorry, y'all, about that. Um, so uh, social structure, um, you know, pigs, are known for kind of being in groups known as sounders. That's what a herd of feral pigs is called. Um, and sounders typically consist of related females and their piglets. Males will stay in the sounder until they're about a year and a half old, and then they go off on their own. And adult males are mostly solitary. Next slide, please. So how do you know if you have pigs? Um, they leave behind a lot of evidence. Um, one of those is wallows, and this is basically pigs have the habit of finding muddy or wet areas when it's hot outside to go and roll around in the mud. 
This is to cool off. It also helps to deter biting insects. This is a pretty damaging behavior because, you know, wherever you have wet areas, like, you know, the edges of lakes and rivers and such, they tend to be pretty ecologically sensitive areas. The vegetation there tends to be sensitive, and that vegetation is also very important for um, holding the soil in place and improving water quality and things like that. So um, pigs, they, when they wallow, they disturb the vegetation, which can lead to erosion. Um, and they also, while they're hanging out in the water, they're going to be peeing and pooping directly into the water, which can mess with the bacteria and nutrient loads in the waterway. Next slide, please. Rubs is another sign of hogs. They, so after they wallow, they've got all this dried mud on them, and so they'll find a pole or something to rub against to remove that dried mud and hair and also parasites. So they can do this on trees, logs, fence posts, rocks. They especially like utility poles that are treated with creosote. And so this can cause financial damage as well as loss of trees if it's frequented by hogs often enough. Next slide. So rooting is probably the behavior that feral hogs are most well known for. This is a feeding behavior. They turn over the soil, they dig in the dirt when they are looking for food. This causes, as you can see, obviously it's gonna cause a lot of damage to vegetation, which can lead to erosion and water quality problems. It's estimated that one pig can disturb six and a half square feet feet of soil in a minute and so the soil structure is fairly complex and when pigs get in there and they turn everything over they mess with the chemistry and the nutrient cycling that's going on within the soil um, which can cause issues elsewhere um, this also disturbing those plants can reduce plant diversity so you have fewer species of plants and shift that community composition. And it also is an opportunity for invasive plants to invade an area where they were not present before. And of course, bare dirt can lead to erosion. Next slide, please. You, another good sign that you have hogs is if you're seeing hog tracks. Um, hog tracks and deer tracks can be a little bit tricky to tell apart. In general, deer tracks are going to be sort of heart-shaped and more pointy at the end, whereas hog tracks are going to be more rounded with the toes kind of going away from each other at the end. Um, you might also see the kickers down there at the bottom. Um, those aren't going to show up in every track, but with deer, they tend to be directly behind the toes, um, and with hogs, they're more on the outside. Next slide. So it is estimated, um, or it was estimated in 2007, that a single pig can cause $300 of damage per year. Um, and there were 5 million pigs at that time. Today we have more pigs. So the 2007 estimate was $1.5 billion. Today it's more likely closer to that $2.5 billion amount. And pigs, they they cause a lot of damage directly as well as indirectly um, with their habits. Can you go to the next slide, please? So pigs, um, they in urban areas, we see a lot of issues with landscaping. Uh, so they can get into things like golf courses, athletic fields, homes, businesses, or irrigation systems. This can be huge. Um, I've also mentioned erosion. You know, our native plants are really great because they have these nice, long, deep roots that hold soil in place and slow down water. Um, and without that, uh, with the disturbance that pigs have, especially since, you know, a lot of times they will concentrate their damage in areas that are near water bodies, it can lead to erosion, um, which is a very expensive problem to fix, um, especially when you have this damage was not caused by pigs, um, but what you see here, those barricades and that photo on the right hand side, they're blocking off the road because it's been undermined underneath there from the, the creek basically undercutting. And of course, this is a problem that's going to cost millions of dollars to fix at this point. 
And vehicle collisions are also a serious problem. It's estimated that vehicle collisions with feral hogs cost $36 million a year in damage. Um, and of course, all, there's also a you know human injury cost there as well. And as we see pigs moving more into urban areas, as well as our urban areas continue to expand, um, we know the pig population is getting bigger and the people population is getting bigger. So these types of conflicts are likely to become more common. Water quality, um, obviously COG does a lot of work with water quality. So we'll talk a little bit about this. They have direct and indirect impacts to water quality. So obviously when they're right there on the edge of a water body and they're turning stuff up um, and peeing and pooping directly into there, you're gonna see things like increased turbidity and sedimentation as well as bacteria and nutrient loads. These things tend to cascade where you're gonna end up having an altered pH, less dissolved oxygen, and then you can also contaminate the water body with diseases and parasites. And if these problems get fat enough, you can actually end up having um, recreation or consumption bans for that water body. And finally, native wildlife. A lot of times feral hogs, you know, when they're rooting around looking for food, they can compete directly with our native wildlife species. So they're harmful in that way through competition, but they're also harmful through predation, particularly on species that live on the ground or ground nesting birds. So things like turkey or quail, um, they can be significant predators of their young. And finally, um, hogs are known for being pretty diseased. They have over 30 diseases and parasites. Um, some of these, several of these diseases are things that humans can contract. And, you know, there are some diseases like leptospirosis, um, which can be spread through urine um, and can persist in water or soil. So when you have pigs that are peeing and pooping directly into a water body, that's kind of a concern for, um, you know, drinkable water, right? They also have lots of diseases that, you know, are a big threat to the domestic swine industry. Um, so things like swine fever or foot and mouth disease, which has been eradicated from the domestic stock in the U.S. since 1929. And the concern is that if it ever got into the feral hog population, that it could, the, the hogs could act as a reservoir for foot and mouth disease. And transfer it to the domestic swine population, which would result in a cost of about $21 billion. Um, so that's not, not a small thing there. Next slide, please. So, you know, we've already mentioned that pigs tend to be pretty adaptable. Um, so what sorts of things can attract them? They can survive in a lot of wide things, but some of their preferred habitats, especially in urban areas are going to be riparian and wetland areas because they like to be near the water to wallow and cool off and that type of thing. Also in urban areas, a lot of our green spaces are our riparian corridors because it's hard to build in a creek, right? So pigs can exploit these areas and use them as habitat and also transportation corridors to move around. Um, they also like thick vegetation for cover. They have a pretty strong preference for crops. If crops are available, they can make up to 50% of their diet. So pigs really like to eat the same type of stuff we eat. And wildlife feeding stations, feeders, can also be a big attractant. So if you've got a feeder out on your property for deer or something else, pigs will absolutely find that and exploit that resource as well. Um, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this because Adam is going to spend a lot of time on this, but control methods, the most effective method in general is going to be to trap and remove as many pigs as possible. So what is Texas Parks and Wildlife doing and how can we help you? Texas Parks and Wildlife has for several years been doing research on feral hogs and the best ways to eradicate them including doing some research on the use of sodium nitrate as a toxicant. So they've been working on that for a long time. Pigs are very susceptible to it, but the, the trick is finding a delivery method that is selective that um, will not harm other wildlife populations. Um, but with feral hogs, it's such a complex issue and they're smart and they're difficult to trap and they reproduce quickly. 
So there's never going to be one single method that will get rid of all the pigs. Um, it's going to need to be a combination of things. So it's what tools can we have in our toolbox to help us fight this issue? Um, Texas Parks and Wildlife, we also have several um, education and outreach resources um, that y'all can use to share with their commu your community. We can help to facilitate community discussions by giving presentations. Um, with feral hogs, most people in generally um, understand that feral hogs are an issue, but because when we're talking about managing feral hogs, we are talking about lethal control. There can still be public concern surrounding that. And so we can help kind of facilitate those community discussions, work with you to develop a management strategy and things like that. And Hannah has some resources to share with y'all. So there is a, a link for a PDF document that has a lot of the information that I covered today um, that I believe she's going to drop in the chat box. And then here there is a short video as well. Hannah, if you could go ahead and bring up the video, we'll see if it works. It, and this is just kind of a good example of a resource that Texas Parks and Wildlife has available. It is just a short little five minute video um, that kind of goes over the highlights of dealing with feral hogs um, and something that you could consider sharing with your communities that you work in. The feral hog is an exotic invasive species that is wreaking havoc on the native ecosystems of Texas and causing extensive damage to native plants, animals, people, and our economy. They're generalists and eat many different things. Due to abundant resources, feral hogs have been successful at spreading throughout the United States, including Texas. With an estimated population of over 2.5 million, Texas is home to more hogs than any other state. Feral hogs' high reproductive rate, lack of natural predators, and generalist approach to habitat and diet has allowed them to successfully spread. If left unchecked, a feral hog population can triple in just one year. Feral hogs often use their snouts to dig for food in the soil. This behavior, called rooting, is one of their most destructive habits. Rooting destroys vegetation, disrupts soil processes, increases erosion, degrades water quality, and is costly to landowners. Wallowing is another negative behavior. Feral hogs wallow in wet areas around water bodies to cool off and to get relief from biting insects. This behavior damages sensitive vegetation and displaces soil around the water body. To stop the damage, feral hogs must be removed through lethal control efforts. Estimates show that in order to prevent the feral hog population from increasing, 66% of the population must be removed each year. Using all currently available control methods, Texas is removing approximately 29% of the feral hog population. Feral hogs are highly adaptable and able to survive in a wide range of habitat conditions, so it's not surprising that they're also able to invade urban areas. In cities, feral hogs use our green spaces as refuges and movement corridors. Due to the high concentration of people, managing feral hogs in cities presents unique challenges. Control methods must carefully consider public safety, municipal regulations, and public perception. Exclusionary fencing can be a viable option for small areas. For large acreages, fencing can be expensive and is typically not sustainable or effective long term. However, fencing does not address the underlying issue as feral hogs are still left alone to reproduce and cause damage to areas that are not fenced in. Furthermore, hunting is not logistically feasible in urban areas. Overall, trapping in conjunction with humane euthanasia is the most effective control method for feral hogs. Box traps can be used to catch individual pigs, such as solitary males. Corral traps are ideal for trapping feral hogs because they allow you to trap an entire sounder, or group of hogs, at one time. Efforts should be made to catch the entire sounder at once, 
because hogs are very smart and become trap shy easily. Animals that escape will learn to avoid traps and become much harder to capture in the future. Every effort should be made to ensure humane treatment of animals during trapping. Traps must be placed in secure areas to prevent tampering. They should be frequently monitored to ensure hogs aren't being kept in the trap too long. Many traps have video cameras that send an alert when an animal has entered the trap. The trap can then be remotely triggered to trap the animals. This allows users to see how many animals are inside of the trap and what type of animal is inside the trap, preventing the capture of non-target species and helping to ensure the entire sounder is in the trap. Feral hogs may be smart, but they don't recognize political boundaries. Successful trapping efforts should consider involving multiple regulatory authorities in the area. Coordinated and carefully planned removal efforts tend to be more effective. When developing a feral hog control program, it is important to have an open and detailed discussion with the community so that residents are aware of what is happening and why. Residents concerned about feral hogs should consider talking to their local community leaders to see what types of control options may be available. Texas Parks and Wildlife Biologists are able to provide technical guidance to communities hoping to manage feral hogs. Controlling feral hogs is an important step to take to protect our native plants and animals, our green spaces, and our water quality. For further information on how to manage urban feral hogs in your area, contact your local Texas Parks and Wildlife Biologist. All right, thanks Rachel for your presentation. Um, I will also include a link to that YouTube video in the chat box for everyone as well, but we'll take any questions for Rachel at this time. And don't worry if you have more questions later, um, we definitely have plenty of time to discuss those during the round table as well. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, so I will turn it over to you, Adam. Okay, well, thank you all very much for hanging in and, and getting into this part. Um, so my name is Adam Henry. I am the Urban Wildlife Damage Management Biologist for the Texas Wildlife Services Program. We're gonna talk about my program in the Metroplex. Uh, next slide, Hannah. And we'll do a little bit of housekeeping. So the Texas Wildlife Services Program is a cooperative program between USDA, APHIS Wildlife Services, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Services, and the Texas Wildlife Damage Management Association. Uh, we have been in Texas in a, as an entity since about 1915, dealing with nuisance wildlife or uh, as it pertains to man's economic interests, uh, a lot of livestock protection. So we have eight districts. Uh, we are currently sitting in the heart of the Fort Worth district. We are 61 counties small. And so we cover quite a bit of country all the way down to, to Temple Bell County down there in the southern tip and Wichita County up in that upper left-hand corner and all the way out to Nacogdoches and Shelby County in that far southern southeastern counties over there. So lots of North Texas uh, country inside and outside of the, the COG uh, coverage area. But I think there's, if you have problems in other areas of the state, I think we certainly have some folks that can help you and get some assistance to you. So as I was talking about, we, we've worked uh, since about 1915 for, uh, to help protect health and human safety, whether that's uh, from predators or on the public or aircraft, uh, flight safety at airports, facilities and structures on buildings and, and other areas, uh, timber, crop timber, rangeland uh, from various species, and moving into the wildlife protection reintroduction, helping get pronghorn reintroduced out in West Texas. Obviously, our sea turtles, uh, protecting them from predation on feral swine is a big one that we do every year and several other threatened and endangered species that we offer assistance as well. So have our hands in a lot of different things. 
So one thing that we talked about uh, early on that we just saw was the type of damage that we have in the Metroplex. Most of it is is residential, right? This is a picture of what we would say is our most common damage. This is what I get a lot of questions about, um, this type of damage. This is probably the most extensive damage that I've seen. This entire yard was rooted up out towards Lake Louisville. And we have to start asking ourselves why they showed up, um, how we make them stop. And so that's what my program does. I try to answer a lot of those questions for homeowners, for cities, different entities. Uh, we try to stop that damage and help offer solutions before it becomes a repeatable reoccurring problem. Most of our areas in town, um, as we just saw in the last video and in Rachel's program, most of our urban areas are safe spaces. You know, I didn't plant this picture. This was actually a, a sign that I use in a lot of my programs. This was out in Tyler, Texas. Uh, that was a sign that was already there. That's why we took the picture because I think it is indicative of the urban feral hog problem is that we do have uh, safe areas. Our whole cities are safe areas for a lot of things. And <clears throat> the hogs have taken advantage of it. They come right in and they, they do what they need to do and retreat back to our, our green belts and our areas where we can't chase them or can't get to them very quick uh, or make any good, good access. And so it makes it a, a challenge in the urban areas. It is a, a very uh, unique situation, but we're seeing that with lots of different animals, not just feral hogs. Uh, so there's some some interesting dynamics. So for fiscal year 2021, uh, our urban project has covered about 70,000 acres. Uh, we cooperate with 11 different uh, entities, whether that's city government or private property landowners throughout the Metroplex right now. We have uh, <clears throat> estimated about $25,000 in damage. And that there's an asterisk on that because it's, uh, when I put in the damage figures, uh, sometimes I don't associate it to this Metroplex swine project. And so that's just what I had underneath the project. I'm also undervaluing some of the damage, just turf damage, because most of our homeowners rake it right over, put a little more fertilizer on it, and it grows right back. So. I'm not seeing most of those homeowners spending a lot of money on fixing some of their, their sod and their turf in their yards. Now the golf courses and other places like that are spending some of that good money to, to fix what has been damaged by the pigs. So I believe that's an under, under a reported value as far as damage in the Metroplex. I think it's certainly probably twice that, if not three times that. I just, uh, when I put those numbers down, I tend to be a little bit uh, undervalued on some of that damage. Uh, as it says here, 277, when I ran my report this morning, I'm actually a little over 300 pigs for the fiscal year on those 11 properties or 11 cooperative properties. Uh, so a pretty good number of pigs that we've removed from the Metroplex in this program this year. <clears throat> um, I think that's a pretty good number to be at. Um, we're not having too many too many occurring issues right now. It's hot middle of summer, um, so we, we do see seasonality on the on the pig damage. So part of my program is the education and outreach. That's what comes along with with my program when I enter into agreement with those cities or private property owners. Um, I want to meet with those property owners. We want to have a conversation with them. We want to make suggestions on ways that they can uh, implement management practices on their property or in their environment um, to to help discourage pigs uh, and maybe change their their patterns. Um, we discuss those options and then we involve them in that solution. I think it's a big part of of the su success of this program is that we are, you know, when we talk about citizens in town, we're engaging with them and we're giving them options so that they feel a part and they've they've got an interest in helping themselves. And I've seen a, a really good response from that. Um, and it's simple things, and we'll talk about it here real quick, but it's, you know, there's some philosophies that you saw in that last video. Um, and some of those are food, water, and shelter. We're gonna try to limit their access to those on certain properties. One of those things is grub control. I spend a lot of time talking about grub control uh, as you saw, those yards 
were obliterated and a lot of it had to do with grubs and the presence of grubs. Um, I spend a lot of time telling folks that they definitely need to get on this program. Um, April, May, as you can see in the diagram here, is the prime time to start treating and make your first application in the spring. That's also those spring months, February, March, April, tends to be a wet time in North Texas, and we start seeing a lot of new growth coming out of wintertime, and the grubs start showing up, and we start seeing hogs rooting around. The other part of this, along with grub control, is nut sedge. We have a lot of nut sedge that is incorporated in with our turf grasses, and it does need to be removed. So along with the grub control is herbicide to, to kill out certain types of nut sedges that we have here in North Texas. Um, but this is a two-stage process with grub control. So back into August, September, that even in October timeframe, I think folks can get away with a second application of grub killer. And we want to try to try to get those cycles happening so that once, you know, usually it takes a good two, two treatments to, to get the grubs under control. I have seen it work uh, phenomenal for folks that have taken it to heart and gone out and got into the grub control side of life. If anything else, the grub killer uh, may act as a deterrent for the pigs and it does keep them off of there and cause them to go somewhere else. And I think we have to remember that we we're trying to change patterns and behaviors. Taking away that food source is a big one. So I spend a lot of time on this one and and talk to a lot of folks about the grub control. I think it's the cheapest thing a homeowner could do that and not overwatering in those time frames. Um, we tend to want green grass early on, so we're already overwatering on top of getting a, a wet spring. Um, in Texas, our temperatures don't usually stay cold enough, long enough to see this hibernation trend that's depicted here in this graph. Um, about December 15th, we tend to have a warm up time and we'll see the hogs show back up uh, in some areas throughout the Metroplex uh, in that mid-December, just before Christmas, typically every year because we get hot and warm and folks go to water in the grass again and it, it causes that same problem all over again. Uh, but very big important thing um, that we can pass on to the public. Mass production is something that is out of our control most years. This is about a two-year-old picture, 2018 or 2019 at this point. Um, these trees, as you can see, were loaded with acorns. Uh, this was up at the South Lake Nature Center, and uh, there's not much that you can do when we have a, a year like that. Uh, those hogs have lots of resources that are naturally falling, and, and I'm not going to get those off of your property, and we're not, I'm not expecting homeowners to come collect all those up. When they're looks like marbles on the ground, it's going to be almost impossible to pick those up or get them out. It's impractical. But we have to understand that that resource, if it is tilled up or we don't, if we disturb it, they will sink into the ground. We will have those acorns for multiple seasons that are residual left over from that one harvest or that one crop production uh, on the landscape. So understanding that there can be some residual food left over uh, in our area would help us kind of defeat that availability if, if there was a way to fence them out. And I spend a lot of time, again, the fencing is a non-lethal solution. Most of our cities have small properties. Um, if we have homeowners associations, we can fence in uh, behind that homeowners association as a group. And it's long-term solution. Once we fence them out, hopefully we won't ever have to have that problem again. And there's multiple types. We, this, we're going to see some pictures. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. We've had several communities that have done some electric fencing on some, some locations, and it's been very cheap linear footage-wise. Um, short fences, we, again, we don't have to have a six-foot-tall privacy fence to keep hogs you know, from gaining access to a property. Three feet is plenty tall enough. Um, most cities, um, depending on your ordinances, you may have a city that doesn't recognize it as a fence until it becomes a certain height. Um, and so you may be able to get away with a, calling it a temporary structure and not have to worry about the ordinances. Just check your local laws and regulations on those things before we start erecting uh, 
exclusionary fencing. But it is a great tool. Again, it gets the landowner involved. Um, they have input. They have ways that they can help themselves. That electric fence that we're talking about, this is the Cistercian Preparatory School in Irving. Uh, they created a practice football field two summers ago. And before that, they had a practice soccer field that was having hog problems. Uh, they started with the electric fence on the practice soccer field, <clears throat> saw how good it worked, and they built a permanent chain link fence around the soccer field. And then when they started construction on this practice football field, they immediately had the same problems with feral pigs coming in. Um, we have a trap back there on the river behind this property. And so in my effort to try to direct hogs towards a trap, we have to limit what they're they're finding. If there's a bag of corn um, is not going to produce the same amount of interest as this fresh sod with all the nice grubs and all the water on it. Uh, and so we had them reinstall the electric fence. <clears throat> it worked great. They had zero damage on it. Um, since then, they've gone ahead and done the same thing as they did on the practice soccer field. They've, they've erected a, a permanent chain link fence uh, on this field, and they've seen the value of not only the electric fence, but fencing in general, having permanent fences around there. Feral pigs in that area are always going to be a problem. Um, the Trinity Trinity River footage right back in the back of that property. So pigs are always going to be moving up and down the, the river there. Uh, as many as we'd love to trap, there seems to always be more coming. And so they've seen the benefit of that. Another thing that we've pioneered doing and started using uh, with wolf predation management in the Northwest uh, is turboflagery. Turboflagery is, as you can see here, is nothing more than electric fencing with flagging added to it. The flagging bars act to, to give the impression of a, an impenetrable barrier. If they get the fear of the fence kind of wears off, they can go and touch the fence and then the electricity jumps right back up at them and teaches them a lesson. Um, some of this is probably not applicable in town. I haven't seen too many folks jumping in on the turbo flagery just yet in town. I think it does have a, a specific place. It can be used uh, effectively here in the Metroplex in certain areas. Um, I think once we get over that fear of electricity on, on with kids and things like that, um, the way the, the controllers work these days, they are a pulse emitter. They don't stay hot the whole time. Um, there is signage that can go along with this, and we put it in strategic areas. I don't think this is going to be right along the highway where we have uh, high traffic to the elementary school every day with kids walking back and forth across it. I think this is something that we're going to put up in strategic areas, uh, keep it up for a little while, train the pigs to stay away from it, take it down at that point, uh, because that's the part about it. It's it's portable. It's it's uh, movable. It, it just works really good, fast. Uh, to take down and put back up. So it's very good temporary fencing until another solution can can make itself present. Certainly, if we had the choice, good quality field fencing is what we would like to see all of the property have. Uh, from a animal control standpoint, good fences make good neighbors. If we had pets behind fences, um, we would solve a lot of problems, but same with the hogs. If we could keep them fenced out uh, with good quality net wire fence, uh, a lot of these problems would would be solved. But again, this is another solution, not relatively expensive, but it you know does cost some money. Um, could be placed behind some structures. Uh, if we had an HOA or something like that that was adjacent to some undeveloped land, it is a solution um, that is available. This is down at in Palestine at the Tennessee Colony prison system and that is their hog barn. They actually had feral hogs coming in to their domestic hog production barns and transmitting brucellosis to their domestic pigs. They also went ahead a step further on one section of their fence and they added that electric fence wire right at the bottom just to add extra insult to injury for those pigs that couldn't get through there. Now we're going to make sure they really get a, a nice jolt and tell them no, stay off of it. But so we can incorporate both into this situation. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I think the biggest thing with the feral pigs is being 
adaptable, uh, making sure we are always changing it up. There's there's no wrong answer. You get to color outside the lines in this profession and we still win the day and solve some issues, uh, especially doing it colorfully. You know, electric fence with flagging, um, have fun with it. We can get party streamers and do all that kind of fun stuff. There's no reason to be stuck in a in a square box. We can have a lot of fun with this. But they did take the solution a step further and added that electric fencing and incorporated both of them together. This is a, a small, about a 30 inch fence here uh, in South Lake, right adjacent to uh, the Nature Center. This is core property on the right hand side in this picture. But as you can see, the homeowners got together. Um, they used wrought iron fencing on the front end where the, the uh, public can see it right against the highway. And this is actually right behind the house. And instead of spending a lot of money, they went got together and they got some utility panels. They used some T-posts. And then they spray painted those T-posts a sandstone color or desert orange or desert tan color. Uh, and it blends right in. Um, during this fall time when this picture was taken, the leaves blend it right in. You really can't see it. So it does produce a barrier that the pigs can't get past, but it's also appealing to the eye. Uh, we can't, we don't have to worry too much about it. You really can't see it from the front of the house. We, it goes right in behind everybody's houses and it's almost invisible, but it serves a purpose. It stopped a big problem. We had hogs coming into from core property uh, up into the front yards and rooting up a, a front yard almost every night. Uh, and we needed a way to funnel those pigs around to the trap. So what this also did was gave me a directional funnel and kind of right back over on this right hand side of the picture, there's a trap back off that direction. Pigs hit that fence and come right on down towards a trap and then allows us to, to trap them and solve that problem. So fences, again, long-term solutions. Once we spend the money, typically we're done. Depending on the fence type, um, electric fences obviously take the most amount of continual maintenance, just making sure they're always working and electrical charges happening. Um, permanent structures are something that uh, are going to be good. We need to, to think about that just on a bigger scale from these new subdivisions, putting them in and, and creating fencing around them may solve a lot of the problems before they ever get started. So when we talk about our direct control, I think we see a lot of cities struggling with some of this. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? You know, are we going to only trap on city property? <clears throat> I hear that a lot. Um, the cities that do conduct their own, they pretty much only trap on city property. We leave a lot of private property out of, of potential use when, we, when we're only trapping on on city property under a city program. Um, our entity does have the ability to make those agreements with private property. So when I'm working for a, a city, we, we go ahead and make agreements with um, private property owners to allow us to trap. And that opens up that property so that we can gain access to find those pigs. Um, another one that we've seen in the, in the past, what are we gonna do to, how are we gonna dispose of the swine? Um, are we gonna use, um, chemical immobilization? Are we going to use firearms? Are we going to trap them and haul them to a, um, a buying station? And, you know, are we, do we hire private trappers? Do you hire somebody like me, a state or government trapper? Um, some of the issues we've seen in other cities are we, we're allowing citizens to hire their own trapper and pigs get left in traps certain times of the year. So, uh, and they expire in the trap with nobody checking them on a weekend. So there's some, some complications in there uh, that happen when we allow that private sector or the private citizen to, to try to help themselves. Doesn't mean they can't do it. There are some great private trappers uh, that are doing great things in the Metroplex and they run a great, great program. I, th I think we just need to vet some of those um, better, vet me better, um, definitely ask all those questions and pick one department. I think that's another big one that I see uh, that we tend to have multiple departments within a city that are having the ability to make their own contracts and do, do their own kind of oversight. And I think one thing that we have to remember is that this is an animal related 
topic and so who gets the call when there's an animal in a trap it's typically not a parks department guy it's not a maintenance head it's going to be your animal control that's your first line of defense so they i think that it me and my dealings when we typically work in cities i tend to gravitate coming back to animal control as being my point of contact mainly because they're going to be the ones to get a call whenever i have a trap in a city doesn't mean we still don't work with those other departments um i think we just need more of a, a whole city approach having everybody on the same page communication is key talking to those different department heads and partners and and having a cohesive program uh, i think works very well for me and my my current situation and at least that's the way i try to run uh, the program so um, if we <clears throat> if we keep everybody abreast of what's going on we typically don't have too many issues and that includes the public i have no problem talking to the public about what we're doing they need to know again it's it, they need this is a pro program for their benefit they need to know about it uh, and so i try not to leave anybody out I try to talk to everybody and keep everybody in the loop on what's going on so touching on those taking pigs to a, a slaughterhouse we do have transportation laws uh, there's the ability to take them to a an approved holding facility recognized slaughter facility uh, or an authorized hunting preserve and i don't know too many cities that are doing that part of it but we do have some in the metroplex that are taking them to uh, slaughterhouses or holding facilities to be sent to a slaughterhouse um, the price that can be garnered from that is anywhere from 10 to 60 cents a pound i think lately it might even be lower than the 10 cent a pound it was down in that five cent a pound for a while i touch base with some folks that buy pigs every now and again just to see their prices and they like i said they've really slacked off quite a bit they're down in that 10 to 20 cent 30 cent a pound right now we have not seen the 60 cent a pound price in about four or five years uh, but there is a little bit of money i think we've got some folks that joined us today that can talk about that in the round table as far as what kind of income they saw from that or they're seeing from that i, I don't think it's enough to fund the whole program you're going to need city funds to to fund the whole program it, there's going to need to be that it may offset it a little bit but it's it's not going to be a great benefit or a great investment coming back on the, that money so what are we talking about as far as equipment i know we touched the base about it in the in the video and in rachel's program um, when we talk about trapping in town or efforts in town trapping is going to be the best solution um, box traps uh, also have a great place in town they are portable packable we can load them up as you can see on this one there's there's actually 10 pigs in that trap um, i put wheels on the top of that trap and so i can load that in the back of my truck when i get to a location turn it over and wheel it back to where i need to go uh, get it tucked in in the behind the house or behind the structure where i have limited access and we can effectively catch pigs with those box traps uh, one thing to remember <clears throat> that's a tool just like any tool we have to know how to use it correctly uh, we hear a lot of talk about box traps not being able to catch a lot of hogs uh, you catch one or two pigs in them and a lot of that is how you bait them. Um, catching pigs, like any other animal, relies a lot on patience. The animals are gonna tell you when they're ready to get caught in the trap. And I don't set this box trap until they tell me they're ready to go. Now, by the, what they tell me is they've cleaned all the corn up consistently multiple nights in a row. Um, everybody's coming and going. We put some trail cameras on this and we see get an idea how many pigs we have coming so we're doing some pre-scouting and some intel gathering on this trap before we ever set a door to catch um, once we've had the right kind of response from the animals then we set the door and we let them catch themselves with this particular trap um, but automated systems can be attached to this one and i would encourage most most folks to go that route in town from a city entity standpoint um, they are very beneficial. So that large automated system and corral trap system is probably the preferred method because we can get lots of hogs in into a trap and they tend to go in a little bit quicker. Doesn't mean we can't catch them in the box trap, <clears throat> but for most situations, 
the large corral trap is going to offer a, a better, quicker solution. Um, there's a host of automated systems on the market right now um, that are available for purchase. A quick Google search should bring up a lot of different options. Um, the option that I tend to have gravitated towards is a standalone uh, live video system that controls a gate so I can hook it to any kind of trap. Um, this is a permanent trap that we have. Uh, it's actually <clears throat> over in the city of Grand Prairie at their landfill and <clears throat> we've set this trap up um, a year or so ago. We had another one there and it just finally got old and worn out and so we had to build a new one. Um, we went just a little bit bigger and made it uh, a little taller so we didn't have pigs jumping out and it's created a very nice trap it stays there year round we open the door when we're not using it so animals can come and go we start feeding it as we need to as they start seeing pigs um, they start feeding it and give me a call and i bring an automated system over <clears throat> and we're able to come in and set it up and hook it up within a matter of minute minutes and off to the races we go now what i've typically gone to um, here in recent years is a pin together corral trap. Um, these panels are <clears throat> six feet tall by 10 feet long. Um, the door in the middle there is a four foot wide, five foot wide, um, five foot tall door. <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, I can hook it to my automated system. <clears throat> it's a standalone uh, trap system. If I need to go back to an animal activated trapping platform, this trap lends itself very well to that. I can transition right back to an animal activated platform or go right into the automated system. It hooks up very well. It fits on a trailer. I can trailer it and set it up within about 30 minutes. And so these are a great platform uh, from a trapping standpoint for, for any of the cities that are thinking about adding auto. Uh, trapping systems, I would say pin together panels uh, with a trailering system is probably the best, most efficient way to go. Uh, animal activated uh, can still be an option. And I think we have to keep options available. <clears throat> Let's don't squirrel ourselves away to just one type of trapping system. If your trap will only activate with an automated system, you, you can't tend to limit your ability to catch a lot of pigs because sometimes there's places without cell service, even in the Metroplex. Uh, but having options is the key to being successful. So uh, any of our systems that I would promote would have multiple triggering options where I can set it up different ways and configure it different ways to be successful in the environment that I'm currently working in. Uh, but there's several manufacturers of pin together panels. Uh, these are bought from a company called Rivera Custom Gates in Lomita, Texas, but there's several other companies around that you can find pin together panels and head gates and things like that. So <clears throat> one thing that we have to remember is there's always a certain number of pigs that just don't enter a trap. And, and when we talk about that in an urban environment, we have to, to be realistic of how how successful we, we need to be. Um, we still have damage occurring um, and it's hard. Again, the pig plays 100% of the process on catching themselves. I can't make them go in that trap. Just because we set a trap doesn't mean that pigs are automatically going to want to go into it. And so in that platform or in that environment, strategic shooting can be very effective. Um, works very well on solitary animals, uh, especially your lone boar hogs that we have walking up and down the Trinity River that tend to bypass traps. Doesn't mean they won't come in because I catch a fair amount of single hogs, but we still have damage occurring and they're not coming to traps. Certain times of the year, they just, they don't want the bait that I'm offering. And so we have to change it up. There's always coordination with the police departments in the towns and the cities that I work in when we conduct those efforts. So every time I show up, I make a call, let dispatch know where I'm at, uh, and we conduct our efforts and either we're successful or not, but they know where I'm at at all times, have contact again, back to that communication uh, with this strategic shooting. As I was talking about, 
this is um, a picture of a pig. This is a thermal uh, scope that I took the picture of with this hog. He was working on a golf course and <clears throat> rooting everything up. Just wasn't paying attention to anything that I was offering him. And so we were able to come in of a night and remove that pig, solve that problem and move on down the road. And so uh, it is very effective in certain areas. It can be done successfully within the Metroplex. Uh, it is being done successfully. And so uh, I think sometimes we limit how successful we are by limiting our, our minds on some of this. I know there's a lot of red tape. We talk about a lot of that stuff. Um, me being a, a government entity allow some of this to happen. I don't know that private trappers are allowed sometimes by cities, but I think with the right communication, we can allow those things to happen. Again, the, we have to have all those communications, everybody talking about what's gonna happen and how it's gonna happen, uh, and it can be effective. Just to kind of wrap everything up, some of our challenges, I know we're gonna get off into some uh, round table stuff here, but I think some of the questions you're going to see here in a little bit, uh, hopefully we can touch base on some of this. Some of the challenges that I see for most of our cities that we deal with, obviously, is budget. That's always a, a factor. How Who's going to pay for it? How are they going to pay for it? Um, manpower comes down to the next one, that part of that budget. Who are we going to pay? How are we going to get them to do it? Um, do we have enough staff on on hand to actually do an effective hog program or another program? And are we using all the tools? Um, trapping can be very effective, but like I, we just showed, you have to use all multiple different tools. Um, one one method is not going to be as effective by itself. We're going to have to incorporate other things. Um, do we have the ability to have a sustained effort? Again, it's back to that manpower and budget. How long can we keep that effort up? Uh, we see that with uh, urban egret problems. You know, it is a financially taxing and manpower taxing situation to do urban egret harassment. Same with urban hogs. <clears throat> and who's, which department do we put this responsibility on? Are we going to, to spread it across each department or can we, like we were talking about, have that one designated department that's a contact point? Uh, for the program to, to work on. Um, and I think one of the other challenges that I didn't list in here is the human factor of public fact, you know, the humans as the public um, causing problems. Um, I have folks that let their dogs want to run around and chase pigs. We have folks hunting in town uh, with dogs um, and guns and bows and arrows and things like that. So certain areas we have uh, the even here in the Metroplex, we still have a hunting public that likes to be devious and let pigs out of traps or hunt them and kill them in your traps and things like that. So you're you're kind of working all these dynamics. And I think we need to keep that in mind. There's there's a lot of dynamics on a project like this in a in a metropolitan area, whether you're a city or a private person or a, another larger entity trying to implement this, it can be done. Uh, and it can be done effectively. You just have to take all of those things into account and plan for it. So with that, I think we are going to move on into uh, any questions y'all might have. Um, if we have anything right now, if not, we'll move into some of the other questions and roundtable session. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, we can take any questions that the group may have at the moment. Um, looks like we have one from Grace Darling. Grub control involves pesticides like, well, I'm going to mess this up. Neo, ne yes, um, that, that kill the larvae of native bees <clears throat> and other pollinators. How do you balance hog damage with the loss of beneficial insects in the soil? Well, I'm going to answer that one just here it's without a typed in answer, but I think we have to remember that when we're applying the grubs, we, we certainly don't have any of our, it's a, it's a short duration of when we're going to apply those grub control. Um, I think we have to remember that we don't see a lot of bees in our turf grasses. They're not finding a lot of flowering plants in our turf grasses. On our native vegetation, when we have native flowers, we do see bees using those areas. Um, and so that would everybody has to make that choice on their own 
uh, of what they want to use. There are some other other things that we can do uh, to limit grubs in our soil if we're going to use natural products. Uh, so you, I would ask you to use what the choice, make a choice for yourself and run with it. Awesome. And then we have Mia Brown from Dallas County saying that they've trapped hundreds of hogs in the past in our open space preserves, particularly in Southeast Dallas County. Sure, we'll eventually have to do it again as well. Um, are Texas Parks and Wildlife or USDA interested in data on these captured hogs? I'm certainly interested in data. Uh, we do disease sampling. Um, on hogs, any hog that I catch in the Metroplex, um, I tend to take blood samples uh, from those animals. We send them off to our, our National Feral Swine Program and our NWRC Research Center, and they stockpile them and keep them. So we're constantly testing um, for different diseases. So anytime anybody has a hog, they, they need to euthanize and want me to take a offer up a fresh blood sample, give me a shout or coordinate with me when I know you're going to trap hogs and we can come and take uh, blood samples if we need to, especially in a county. Um, I've taken some from Dallas County, but that Ellis County, Rockwall County, some of the Collin County stuff, we haven't taken a lot of samples in. And so those are hot counties for me to try to get samples in. But yeah, we definitely certainly good to know um, what we're all taking. I think it, it helps us all out knowing what we're where the efforts are and what kind of efforts are going on in the region. Awesome. And it looks like we have a comment from Chase Brook in response to Grace's question. Uh, one consideration is method of application. Soil applied pesticides will impact aerial pollinators differently than soil applications. And then again, timing of grub treatments versus migration times for uh, butterflies, et cetera, are also important to take into consideration as well. I like that answer. That was a great answer. Awesome. Okay, so it doesn't look like we have any other questions. So we're gonna go ahead and roll right into our moderated round table. So again, we're going to um, be utilizing Poll Everywhere. And I will, um, be dropping that link again in the chat after I get this question up. So the first question that we have for you all is, does your entity manage feral hogs? And if you do, what process um, does your entity use to manage them? And what we'll be doing is, um, Adam, just confirming, we're gonna roll through all of the questions and then we can come back and discuss further. Right. Yeah, let's do these questions and then we'll bring them up in our round table for questions and answers and stuff. Perfect. Awesome. Looks like we've got some more refreshing and coming in. All right. We will move on to our next question that we have for the group. Um, approximately how much feral hog damage occurs annually at your entity? I'm talking um, financial amounts or acreage, and um, we'd be happy to hear any responses that you may have. All right, our next question is, do you feel your entity's program for managing feral hogs is successful and effective? This one seems to actually be populating live. That's great. All right. And our next question, uh, how much does your entity's feral hog program cost annually? And then after this, we just have a few more questions for you all. Let's see if I'll reconnect. Mostly staff time. So even staff time costs a little bit of money, right? All right. Our next question is, what departments at your entity are responsible for managing feral hogs? Awesome. So it looks like animal control is the biggest in the world. A word cloud here or animal services. Um, Adam, 
<laughs> stormwater parks code. And those are those are all the groups that I figured we would see. I, I think that's a very good set of groups. Even that dude in there named Adam, I expected to see him in there somewhere. So <laughs> awesome. OK, moving on to our next question here. OK, so what hurdles has your entity encountered in establishing and or conducting a feral hog program? And you can submit uh, multiple responses to this as well. So our word cloud will look um, hopefully really nice. Awesome. Funding, firearms, budget, property access, manpower. That's a lot of what I expected to see as well. All right, and then our final question that we have for the group today before we begin our discussion is, do you provide outreach to the residents of your entity about feral hog management? Awesome. That's awesome. All right, that is the last question I have. So uh, Adam, just tell me which one you'd like to start on. We can go from there. Well, let's just work our way backwards, I think. Goodness gracious, that's a lot of folks giving outreach. I think that's amazing. That was a lot more than I thought would be there. Um, I think it's about the time everybody gets to interject. Um, we're going to talk on this one, and I just amazing. I, I wouldn't expect in that kind of a uh, answer from the outreach course. It may be me giving some of that outreach for some of these folks, but uh, I think the more we can have a conversation about this and bring it up to our public and give them productive ways, I, I, I think it's, it's going to help everybody out. So that's awesome. If we want to back up on our questions and we'll just roll back on our. So <clears throat> this is not a surprising situation. I think um, funding is obviously the biggest one for everybody. And for some of the majority of the folks in here that are part of my program, we have had uh, for the last several years uh, federal funding to conduct our efforts. So that has meant a low cost, zero cost to the city entities or the folks that I collaborate with um, to conduct their feral hog efforts. I think that most cities are probably in that ten to thirty thousand dollar range if they had the right tools and were trying to to kind of work it out. I think we should be in that realm of uh, expenditures for budgets. Uh, for many years, even contracting with a private trapper, I used to tell folks about ten thousand dollars from a city entity standpoint. Um, I see Ray just jumped on with City Arlington, Ray. Do you want to answer some of that? Maybe what it, since I know you do your own in-house trapping, what what do you think annual cost for y'all? Yeah, well, now that we have all the equipment, you know, we had yep. to get that initial. Uh, we 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 got a trailer. We've got some box traps, um, and we have a round pin that we keep pretty, uh, kind of like what you did at that Grand Prairie, uh, mm -hmm. and, and keep it regularly there. Um, once we got all that equipment, that equipment was expensive. And then, of course, then you have your uh, your, your cameras that come back and, uh, you know, you got the cost for those. And uh, now we're transporting all of ours to um, to a processor and we're uh, we receive some of that money back, but it's probably between 200 and 400 dollars a year tops. Yep, yeah, that's about what I figured it would be. Thanks, Ray. Any other questions on the funding with the group? This is the part everybody gets to talk, so talk to me. Okay, well, so we have mums a word around here. Let's back one up there, Hannah, and we'll get back to that next one. Oh my goodness, this is a host of, this goes back to that thing. We see animal control coming up as it should be. Um, I know some some animal control don't want to have the, the feral hogs underneath their umbrella, but um, they are that designated kind of people in their cities. And I, I think that is the point where we should probably be coming back to 
doesn't mean we don't have some of the stormwater folks doing it and, and everybody's different, uh, just depending on the inter entity. Um, but for a metropolitan or city municipal government, animal control makes the most amount of sense. So, uh, okay, Hannah, one more. We'll go ahead, oh, Ray. I was going to say, uh, we, do, we are in over it, but that doesn't mean we're not working with our parks department. Uh, right. You know, they go out and they help us with traps. They help us store the traps. I mean, it, it's a collaboration. Right. It's just if somebody gets yelled at, it's us. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's and that's the way it ought to be. I, I think um, when we talk about cities, it should be you know one city. We're all working for the benefit of that that city as a as a city entity. So um, it should be everybody working together on that. And that, but uh, I understand we have some of the divide in some departments, but in some cities. But uh, for the most part, I I think we can all work together to accomplish that goal with feral pigs. Okay, Hannah. We won't spend much time on that one. I, I, I think we kind of talked about that one. I think in that we're seeing that's about the right numbers um, on what I kind of figured it would be that 10 to 25, 75,000 is pretty, pretty lofty. Um, I didn't see that one before, but um, as there, like you said, startup costs, once you buy the equipment, um, an automated system is anywhere from $2,400 uh, as, as a standalone unit. And then there's monthly costs, service plan costs that you're looking at another five to 600 a year uh, for your cell phone cost on that unit. Um, if we talk about pins and, and enclosures, uh, any one of them can be Fifteen hundred to eight thousand dollars, depending on the the contraption that you want to buy. So um, once you get past that, you're talking about manpower, hours, and paying a contract trapper. If you go contract trapper or in house, you're looking at manpower, and and those all costs start adding up. So uh, nothing out of the norm here. Anybody want to add anything to that? That maybe. Well, hey, I was going to ask, has anybody else had problems with people stealing traps? <laughs> Ray, I'll jump in. Nobody stole the trap, but we have people that like to let the hogs out of the traps. We've had that happen more than once. Yep. I did have some cameras stolen over there at Trinity View Park. So just regular trail cameras got snagged, but I knew they were going to get snagged a few weeks ago. So no big deal. But yeah, I think I talked to Brett Johnson yesterday and he was saying they just straight across on the Dallas side there from Trinity View Park, they're having some folks jumping into traps and actually killing pigs in their traps at the moment. I don't know if Brett joined us today or not, but uh, we were talking about it yesterday he was letting me know that had some folks doing that so it does happen okay let's back up and we'll get one more question cover that one that's a pretty good that's a pretty good pretty good answer i think we're on the top end of yes and no right there we're in the middle we somewhat effective yes i i think um I'm glad to see that we're saying that we're that much. The somewhat is is up there high, and the yes is over 40 percent. So that means something's happening for everybody. Maybe we're as a group we're coming up with our efforts and our abilities, um, and we're having good good success. So that's a nice thing to see. Um, I have a question for the group. What what would make your program more successful and effective if if the funding barrier could be removed out of curiosity's sake what what would be something that the group would feel that would make it more successful is it public education is it more traps is it um more resources what would it be my answer would be if adam did it all for me and i didn't have to do it no more <laughs> Well, um, that's interesting, Ray. Um, we just need to make that happen, I guess, right? Right, Corey? We just need to make that happen. He, he needs to go ahead and make that happen, right? I was just yeah. going to say, we need more Adams, but because I don't like sharing, but he's been doing a good job. <laughs> and um, we recently partnered up with him. We had a, a different private contractor before, and 
I think we're really happy with the results we're seeing. So not to give you a plug, but I totally just did. Yeah, and, and we appreciate I know you've been helping us with the with the golf course on the other side. And I think you I think you even ended up catching more hogs than we did this year. So um, you know, it comes back to that collaboration. It's been working really good that we work between departments, but it's been really beneficial um, having you all help us as well. Well, and I, I think that's um, part of that overall Metroplex program. Um, the more people we have, I don't work on everybody all the time. I think that's a big one that we have to to stress is that I'm spread out amongst so many cities, um, 11 entities is is taxing to be there all the time so uh, we come in stages so we're constantly baiting things and we're checking everything and i rely on y'all's input letting me know what's going on and where it's happening um, and the collaborative effort is amazing that we have um, we've got folks in south lake and trophy club west lake um, that when they start seeing problems their staff gives me a call and we we make a plan and come up there. There's times when I'm tied up. I got a feeling uh, coming up this early winter, October, we're going to have pigs everywhere again, like we normally do. And in the spring, we tend to have pigs just popping up everywhere. Um, but hopefully we've got enough equipment out and moving around that we can service everybody. But I think that's another big one is, is um, the collaborative effort because pigs that are affecting you guys in, in Arlington, and Irving may, you know, we've got Dallas folks that are doing an effort over there and they're taking some of the pressure off of, of y'all cities just by relationships. And so having a, a coordinated effort in the Metroplex benefits everybody. Um, we're, we're working all the way up and down that, that Trinity River Basin and all of those tributaries, putting a program together like that does affect by default everybody that, that is in, in contact there so that's awesome so this one's always a hard one for most of us to quantify i see that 10 to 15 thousand a year that we had some folks reply uh, golf courses landfills parks and businesses um, bob jones park is an all natural area so we're gonna have um, pigs that show up there off of the lake and they're gonna come and go periodically and so that's always going to have some damage um, throughout the year. It's going to be hard to, to quantify some of that. Um, so, well, let's, uh, let me ask a question on this one right here. Is it, is it that when we start talking about damage for cities, is it that there's not very much city damage or, and that's hard to quantify or is there, more private property damage or less private property damage and more city damage that y'all are seeing since most of us are, are heavy towards the municipal government in the in the forum. Go ahead, Ray. I'm oh, sorry, I was waving to somebody leaving. But, oh. uh, um, ours, ours is uh, mostly, uh, we, in the initial, when we initially started, I think we started our program in 2013, and it started because they were turning over people's yards and then we just put our main focus into pushing back um to getting trapping in the in the uh, park area along the trinity river around uh, that area so we would stop them from getting in there it took a couple years for that to happen and then that property damage went down and it was really helpful too because we're right next to fort worth and fort worth did a, an incredible job of trapping on the other side of river legacy too so between both things we kind of got the numbers down um and, and it kept it out until here recently they're going into the viridian and the gar uh, the golf course further east of us but um it, it, it was beneficial it, it took a couple of years to get it so we could try to keep them out of the neighborhoods was the goal well if we want to back up again we'll catch a couple more questions i think we're pretty i think everybody has a fair handle on what to do with pigs right we kind of i think at this point in the game everybody we probably won't spend too much on this one um I'm more concerned about the fact that they don't do anything. We're unsure of what we're doing, 42%. Unsure what we're going to do with our pigs when we do that with them. But let's move on. I, I think we know what we're going to do. And that each, each entity makes their own decision on how they're going to handle that 
that one, so. And I think that is our last question that we have for the group. Okay. Uh, so we can take any additional questions that we have at this time. I know we're budding up. We have about seven minutes left before everyone breaks for lunch. Um, so we can answer any final questions that the group may have. Well, I, I have a question. Has anybody thought about, because this is great that we're using the technology the, uh, to do these meetings virtual. Have we thought about because I think Adam made a great point that working together and knowing where all the hogs are and stuff is anybody thought about either doing like a GIS map that we can put all this into so we can see who's trapping what and where they're going and, and maybe see patterns in the data. Um, that sounds like something that, uh, you know, if one person headed up and we all put in that data that would maybe help us in knowing where the problems are and that's a great question. I remember from the 2019 forum, we had somebody from Texas A&M AgriLife present on the feral hog reporting tool that they have, but that is specifically for siting um, and not necessarily like the trapping in the back end side that um, all of our municipalities would be interested in. I wonder, I wonder, Rachel, if something like the iNaturalist couldn't been, you know, how we have, you have that iNaturalist app that you can when you see something, you can report it on there. I wonder if it's a if there's a way to report it on there. If there's a way to add feral pigs into that, <laughs> I don't I don't know of anybody currently doing that um, in the Metroplex. So yeah, um, I naturalist definitely jumped to my mind. Um, unless someone has a um, <laughs> has enough IT staff that they could somehow create a map for cities to use. Um, I know that stuff can be pretty expensive. Um, so iNaturalist, if you go and look now, you're definitely going to come across incidental observations of hogs. Um, and you can filter um, iNaturalist results by, like, so you can filter it and say, show me feral hog observations in the DFW Metroplex or the city of Arlington or Grand Prairie or whatever, and you can even filter it down to a certain time frame. Um, now, the, you know, the, the issue with that is it's citizen science, and so it's just what people are encountering and what people are seeing. So I don't know that the average homeowner is going to... Uh, you know, they're, they're, if, they're, if they wake up and their yard is all torn up, the lot, their first thought is probably not going to be, I'm going to go document this on iNaturalist. Uh, that would be great if it was. But I think that there would be potential if there is an interest in that. We could set up a project on iNaturalist where the folks managing these issues can go and report observations. And that, you know, it's an existing infrastructure. It wouldn't cost anything. All it would take is getting folks to go in and report it. But yeah, we could totally start like a North Texas feral hog project on iNaturalist and people could go and report their observations and anyone would have access to that to go and look. I'd be interested in, in some of that. That would be very helpful for, I think, I, I hope it may be helpful to some of the wrong people. I don't know, all those folks wanting to chase hogs with dogs along the trinity river <laughs> good or bad I, you know anybody hunting a hog is is definitely helping out i hope but uh, certainly could be very beneficial for keeping a group you know we've talked multiple times about having a, a management group of you know like you were bringing up hannah the time before it was kind of brought up for an open forum of management group and it just didn't happen so that would definitely be beneficial. Yeah, I mean, it it would be a pretty low investment to get that started. It wouldn't take a whole lot of time. Um, it wouldn't cost any money. And um, the key would be, can we get folks to reliably report observations there? So it's just a matter of what is the level of interest in maintaining something like that? And we could also put it out there to um, you know, the, the general public as well. We've got a very active iNaturalist community. 
um, here in DFW. So, the, you know, there are certainly master naturalists and other folks out there who would be interested in, you know, contributing to the project of like, hey, if you see hogs, please add them to this project. So, yeah, there's there's potential there. We have something where we do we do report they do report wildlife sightings and hogs are one of them in Arlington, but I was thinking more of us as a team, you know, all of us collaborating together so we know who's trapping what who's doing what so maybe we can see. Um, like one year, you know, we trap 20 hogs and um, this uh, another city next to us drop traps. 10 and then that next year we catch 50 and they catch 10 you know to show that we're working back and forth or um, maybe even helping each other maybe a communication tool too well i i agree with that uh, to me that's a the big communication tool um i did that with brett at dallas we were talking about hogs on one side and if he, I was asking him if he had traps going on over there you know I do that with you Ray we, we talk um, on what y'all are doing um, so yeah it would be great to have another platform to to keep lines of communication open to let everybody know what's going on so so what you're saying is we need another a North Texas management hog management meeting is what we need <laughs> Hosted by COG, right? Every Hannah's going to have one every, you know, twice a year, maybe once a year. We have a, another one of these. And, and I would think the people, and I can't remember, they were at the last forum um, that did the water, um, the water quality down south or south of the Metroplex, and they were talking about the hogs that were here. You'd think they'd want to know too how many are being caught and what's going on with that too. It might be. It, it might be good just to have that communication and even if it's something where we could map it and underneath you know how many hogs were caught in this spot and this spot and this spot and then and that way we're all talking together too maybe on a more continual basis well that's funny i i was trying to do something like that for my program and show where i had taken pigs with a metroplex map and i wasn't able to get that done yet so um that's what i was thinking on the lines of something like that where we'd have a way to drop a pin and show hogs we're taking here and and there um just keeping it updated <laughs> somebody managing that one so um it wouldn't come with a map i don't think but slack um, I don't know how many folks on the call are familiar with Slack, but Slack could potentially be a um, good communication tool. It's a basically a social media app or website, um, and you can add people to the group from all sorts of different organizations, and you can create like sub um, forums or whatever and people can just go on there and post so it would be you know anyone would have access to it. it's basically like a message board almost um a modern version of one um but people could go and they could add like hey for this month we trapped 30 hogs or something like that and you know it would be a, a platform for communication at least so I'm going to pause everyone. I know that we were having some really great conversation. I'm going to drop the poll everywhere link back in the chat because I have opened the presentation feedback um, part of the part of the day. Um, so please fill that out if you have suggestions for future topics. We'd love to hear them um, as well and continue this great discussion. Um, I definitely think that feral hogs is continuing to be a priority for our TMDL program. So I don't see why we wouldn't have another one of these meetings in the near future, um, depending on what their priorities are. Um, I do have a couple of slides to roll through really quickly. We do have some upcoming subcommittee meetings where we will talk about what um, occurred today and determine future priorities for FY 2022. So the Stormwater Technical Subcommittee, which is the subcommittee that um, is kind of the champion of feral hogs and other associated issues, will be meeting on September 14th via Microsoft Teams. 
our wastewater and monitoring uh, technical subcommittees will meet the following um, two Tuesdays after that. And then our wastewater and treatment education roundtable is meeting on October 7th. Um, public education task force is meeting on October 20th. And then the Upper Trinity River Basin Coordinating Committee meeting, which is similar to our TMDL program, but um, is a little bit more geared to like people with watershed protection plans and other projects outside of the TMDL area will be meeting on February 15th. Um, a general reminder that this workshop was recorded and we will be posting it online and all of the registrants will be receiving an email with a link to all of the slides and the recording once we've got those posted and available online. Um, and then finally, here is my contact information. I know we've had some people that had to jump off already, um, but if you have any outstanding questions or comments, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, and I know we were just having really great conversation. So if we want to go back to that, I am very um, intrigued to listen to more, but I just wanted to give everybody an opportunity that needed to jump off to lunch. They could uh, have all this information. So I will stop talking now. <laughs> well, it looks like we still have about 13 folks hanging out, but they've been very quiet. So for the group that's remaining, are there any unanswered questions that we can answer? I know we've We've kind of got our own banter going back and forth with three of us talking, um, but I definitely want to include y'all. I know y'all are here to to hear things, so feel free to chime in and unmute yourself and talk and ask a question or ask oh, this, this Tim Benefield, I'm with the uh, Dallas County Utilities and Reclamation District here in uh, Irving uh, over in the um, Las Planas area. We manage uh, Decurd here, then we manage Irving Flood 3 and Irving Flood 1, which we know they're, uh, we're a flood control district. Mm -hmm. um, we have se trapped several hogs, especially over at Flood 1 and Flood 3. We don't see them too much here in the urban center. We have had a few come up, but not too many. But uh, it seems like uh, we had a bunch of construction going on at Flood 1 uh, up to about a year ago and pretty much ran the pigs off um, luckily because they seem to love to get out and root around on our levee and for us you know for parameters through the core you know we can't just go out there and put dirt back on top of the levee we have to compact it in a certain way make sure it's lifted in a certain way and all this and it gets to be costly over a period of uh, you know months or years, it seems like one place and we go out there and we fix it and get it looking all nice again. And we go, I go drive through, you know, two days later and they were just back at the same spot again. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it's just you know, feral hogs are terrible. I um, mean, yeah, I own land out in West Texas. Uh, this year, I've probably shot over 100 pigs off my property. Yep. Um, I started with two pigs when I first bought this property six years ago. Up to, you know, now I'm shooting 100 pigs a year. My neighbor up the road, uh, he traps them. Uh, he's probably trapped over 300 pigs this year. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, you seem like you get them down to a manageable number. Then all of a sudden my game cameras, I'm like, oh my gosh, where did this group come from? <laughs> you know, and they're back up to 30, 40 pigs, you know, coming in by cameras. And like you said, they have a routine because, I mean, I was just out there this weekend, me and my son were, we shot about eight. And um, I see them on my camera and I'll first see them at my son's and they go to one of my feeders, which I've got three feeders at my stand and they'll just hit all three of my feeders. Then they'll go off and, you know, go another direction. So it seems like, you know, they got a pattern that they like to follow. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's getting to be a nuisance. I know a lot of the farmers out there where I'm at, they've got a lot of crop fields and uh, my land's at. And they, you know, they want to poison them to get rid of them. But, you know, that's going to come with the risk of poisoning uh, other animals, the deer, and, you know, stuff like that and you know but my question is do you think for areas like us here in the urban center 
flood one, flood three, you know, we don't have the deer hunting around here. Do you think the poison will be a, a good option or do you think just trapping them and getting rid of them that way? So currently we, we don't have a toxicant that's available. Um, there is one that just hit the market that is a, it's a sterility drug. Um, it's, it's out there that just recently hit the market. Um, so the way we tend to see the toxicant being used is for areas that don't lend themselves well to other methods. Um, because if, if we're talking about sodium nitrite on the landscape, we're going to have pigs that are dead within a, within a half mile. Um, so that means we potentially have pigs that, um, in the urban area that could wander out of those in a, in a potentially drunken state, um, before death occurred, they potentially could wander and, and cause a problem on a traffic intersection or come up into somebody's backyard. Um, and then they succumb and now we've got a dead animal on the landscape in an urban area. So I don't expect us to utilize the poison in an urban area first. Doesn't mean we won't eventually get to that point. Um, we are seeing some great results as far as success rates, um, 80, 80 plus percent kill rates uh, with sodium nitride in the trials that we've seen so far. So it does have the ability to kill pigs and, and kill a lot of them. Um, like like was said, our current issue is delivery device and formulation so that it doesn't affect non-targets. And in the urban area, I'm not sure that that's something that we would we would try to come with first, um, just because of the public aspect of people coming in contact with it. I mean, we got kids eating Tide Pods right now for challenges on social media, we definitely don't need one of them taking a spoonful of sodium nitrite and thinking it's fun. Um, and there's always somebody around that's potentially gonna get into something. So I, I don't see it as a, a viable option at the moment. Doesn't mean it won't, doesn't mean it can't. It just means that currently that's not, there's not that option. Um, I think trapping and, and potentially all using all the methods um, what we have at the moment good or bad it's just what we have at the moment so um, hopefully that answers <laughs> as broadly as i can with that one but yeah i, I appreciate it it's just something that's uh, come up in our discussions and uh our what, staff meetings and stuff like that what are y'all what kind of traps are y'all using on the on the levee we just got a box trap okay set up uh in a couple of strategic locations um, like I said, we're not seeing as many now as we were. Mm -hmm. um, it really dictates on what the river is doing. Yep. If the river is uh, way up, we start seeing them more and more on the levee. Mm -hmm. But now since the river has finally gone back down, they, they're pushing away and staying more close to the uh, river because there's more of a source there for them. Yep. So um hopefully it'll stay like this for a while we won't have to get out there and uh get rid of them anymore well if there's uh anything we can do as far as our our agency can do to help you please we'd certainly entertain trying to offer some other you know trapping assistance or anything like that that we can offer um yeah we had we had one set up about Oh, six years ago, right behind one of our pump stations. Yeah. And I was just doing my, uh, this was over Irving Flood 1, and I was just doing one of my routine drive arounds and was driving down the top of the levee and looked down over there, and here's two guys over trying to load that trap up on the ones that are four-wheelers and <laughs> <laughs> trying to haul it off. <laughs> Yeah. So they dropped it and ran like crazy and went across the river over the Dallas side. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, I think it's just going to be an ongoing deal. But, you know, especially here in the rural area, I think where we're at now is starting to 
decrease with the river going back down. So hopefully it's going to be like that for a while. Well, and that, yeah, and we're actively trapping, you know, I'm actively trapping in Irving. So right along that, that corridor of the river right in there, um, the golf course all the way around from the landfill and up towards that Trinity View Park side over there. Yeah, uh, I know about uh, Cistercian. We work with Cistercian too. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, it, I think we're always going to have them. The, the river offers a great corridor. Um, and so the best we can do is try to catch all we can and, and kind of live with the rest of them from time to time. Um, and like we were saying, I noticed we had had some folks kind of questioning using the pesticides and stuff. And I, I think everybody needs to understand it. It's not a have to. You know, when we, we choose to use those things as managers, we try to implement things that are going to be best for, for our program. Uh, the tools and, and tips and things that we're talking about for everybody doesn't necessarily mean it's going to fit everybody's program. There's going to need to be adjustment and modifications to you know, grow control and, and trying to stop that food, water, shelter uh, relationship with those pigs that we're going to have to come up with creative ways um, to kind of stop the damage or to live with the damage. There's a certain amount we're going to have to live with. It, it's just part of it. So anybody else? I know we've still got nine folks hanging in there. So anybody else got some questions? I think the most of what is left is the uh, is COG staff, Cog but folks? it looks right. like maybe we have somebody that, oh, I think Katie Myers yeah. from TRWD has her microphone unmuted. So Katie? Yeah. I was going to jump in real quick um, about Ray's idea to have, you know, some kind of map that everyone can look at, and y'all talked about that a little bit. Um, I used to work at the COG, for those who don't know that. And I think it must have been way back in like 2018. I think Myra and I kind of looked into that and we were looking at that uh, Texas A&M reporting tool, but at the time they hadn't transitioned to the new tool yet. So we had been talking to the people who kind of made like the experimental or early version of that reporting tool about creating some kind of backdoor access where maybe, you know, a designated person at the cities would be able to go in and put locations of where they're trapping and, and where they're seeing stuff um, so that only those people could see it and access it and not the general public. So that, I don't know exactly where that went because I, I left in 2018 um, and they did the transition from one tool to the other. So I, that must have gotten dropped uh, somewhere along the way, but the idea has been brought up before. I don't know if that Texas A&M tool is the best avenue, um, but it's a good idea. I know that people want it because they've we've talked about it before. So just a little bit of background. And that's a great point. Um, I know that Josh, I believe was his name, who came from A&M AgriLife in 2019, um, at our most recent feral hog forum, and he did present on that, I guess, finalized uh, public facing feral hog reporting tool, but that has been the last discussion about it. Um, I know that at that meeting, the group also said that they'd like some backdoor access, if you will, but it, I don't know if it was, it's obviously it's been two years since, so I'm not quite sure where AgriLife is at in that process either, but that's definitely something that COG can check into if the group feels necessary and the coordination committee also would like to move forward on that too. I can I can reach out to Josh Helsel with NRI and since that was kind of his baby on the app, I'll, let me touch base with him and see what the app offers. I assume that it was more along the lines of something like the iNaturalist where you just plot of, you know, we saw X amount of pigs. I don't know if there was any way to use it as a, a, a true update of what's going on, but I'll explore that with him, see if there's not something we can, maybe there's a way to morph that and use that one to some extent. So I'll check awesome. on it. We would greatly appreciate any updates that you have because yeah. <laughs> so I can take that to the coordination committee, but. No problem, definitely. But it's, I keep hearing this, it sounds like we need a, a regional 
I hate to use the word task force, but it sounds like that's what everybody's kind of leaning towards of a, at least a working group of information that kind of gets pushed out and updated periodically. I would, I would agree that we have been hearing the same things on our side. <laughs> but um, okay, well, we're 20 minutes over. Uh, I am getting very hungry. So I do believe that this workshop has now been adjourned. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Like I said, my contact information is on this slide. Stay tuned for that follow up email with all of these great resources. And um, thank you all again. I appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you.